This summer at Prairie Lakes Church, we're gonna be tackling some big theological topics. These are hard topics, but we're gonna be the type of church that addresses these kind of issues. But one reality is that we aren't going to be able to fully unpack the theological depth of these issues. We've got a 30 minute sermon to just scratch the surface, half an hour to look at the tip of the iceberg. We know we can't do full justice to these issues with the time we have, but we can dig in and start to look at some things differently. We can hear a perspective that may be different or challenging. We can begin to think about this topic in a way we haven't ever thought about before. So let's put 30 minutes on the clock. Ready, set, go. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church this weekend. Whatever campus you're at, if you're watching online, we're really, really glad that you are here. And as ridiculous as that video was, uh, there are a lot of Iowans and a lot of our people in little Iowa that believe heaven is like that, right? Like it's a good place. And as long as I just do a little bit more good than bad in my life, or as long as I'm better than most people, I'll wind up in heaven, in the good place. But here's the deal. The Bible does not describe heaven that way at all. And as we're going to see, the reality of who gets into heaven and how we get into heaven and what heaven is really like is far more simple and it's way more glorious than that video could ever explain. And this weekend, uh, we're going to talk about heaven and hell, what happens when we die. And we're going to answer some of the most pressing questions we have about the afterlife and some of the most neglected and confusing parts of the things that we believe the Bible teaches. Now, as I teach this weekend, uh, you may be a little unsettled. I'm just going to give you a little warning. Uh, it might feel like the ground is shifting a little bit beneath your feet. Because what we're going to look at is what the Bible teaches about the afterlife. Not what Oprah says, not what your parents or grandparents may have taught you, and even not what popular culture believes. We're going to look at what the Bible actually teaches. And here's what we're going to see. That heaven is glorious and amazing. And that heaven should give us all hope and joy and confidence in this life and in the life to come. And we're going to see that the Bible teaches that heaven is a place that we can have comfort and great expectation for. It's really, really exciting. And so let's start the way we always do. Grab a Bible and grab something to write with it. Your campus, if you didn't bring a Bible, there should be one near you. And raise your hand right now if you need a pen and all the ushers are going to come down. And they will put a pen in your hand. And I want to encourage you to take notes on the back of your bulletin is a great spot, and I want to encourage you this weekend to start at the top and write small, because <laughs> I'm going to give you a lot of stuff to write down about heaven and about hell, this afterlife that awaits us. Now, here's what we're going to see. Uh, I talk to a lot of Christians who say this, well, the Bible doesn't say a lot about heaven or hell, the afterlife, and they're wrong. The Bible says quite a bit. In fact, there's a whole lot in the Bible about the afterlife, and we're going to look at a lot of that this weekend. And as we begin, we're going to begin in the most comfortable, fun spot to start, and that is death. <laughs> we're going to start at physical death. And here's what you need to know when it comes to the afterlife. When you die, when I die, or those who've already died, when we die, here's what happens. Our spirit, our soul is temporarily separated from our physical body. And the temporarily word is really important. We're going to get to that in a moment. But our spirit soul is temporarily separated from our physical earthly body. And we face what's called the judgment of faith, where either our spirit soul goes to heaven or to hell. There's no third direction. There's no third spot. It's one or the other based on where we put our trust. And according to the Bible, the only way that we get to heaven is simply this, by trusting in what Jesus has already done for us. That's it. There's no other way to heaven. It's trusting in the perfect life of Jesus and his death for us on the cross. In fact, these are Jesus' words, very own words about this subject. We know these verses most of us do. John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for... God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And look at verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. The only determining factor between heaven and hell, according to Jesus, is whether we trust in him or not. That's it. And notice Jesus doesn't say anything about good works. He doesn't say anything about doing good. He simply says this, if you believe, you're not condemned. If you don't believe, you're already condemned. So what is hell and what is heaven? Here's a definition of hell. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Hell is a place of eternal conscious punishment for the wicked. And I know that's a mouthful. 
But essentially, here's what that means. Hell is an awful place because individuals suffer apart from Christ eternally. That there's awareness. That they, even though they physically are dead, they're not dead. That, that those people's souls suffer in eternity forever. That they don't lose themselves, but they lose access to God's presence. That's what hell is. And hell is a terrible reality. It's an awful reality. And some people want to deny the existence of hell, but if you take the Bible seriously and you read the Bible and you hear Jesus' own words, you have to accept this reality. Now, the opposite is even better, heaven, okay? So here's what heaven is. It's a little longer definition, but heaven is the place where God most fully makes known his presence to bless. It's the place where our needs for security, significance, and pleasure are perfectly met. Heaven is the place where God dwells. And heaven is the place above all else where we expect, experience rather the blessing of God, his favor and his goodness. And heaven is the place where all of our desires are met in Christ. Heaven is a wonderful, wonderful reality. And here's one of the most important things I want you to write down this weekend about heaven. Here it is, one of the most misunderstood parts about the heaven that we will be in. Here's the reality. There is a present heaven and there's a future heaven, and they are different. Now, I was probably 23 years old when I learned this reality, and it made the Bible make a whole lot more sense. So there's a present heaven, and here's the deal with the present heaven. That's where we go. If we were to die today, we would go to present heaven. Your loved ones in Christ that have died, they are in present heaven right now. But here's what you need to know. Present heaven is temporary. Heaven the way it exists now is not the way it will be Forever, as we will see in this message from God's word, when Jesus returns, we will all be resurrected. We'll all be raised, some to eternal death and punishment, some to eternal life on a new heaven and a new earth, where we will receive resurrected, perfect bodies, where we will live with God's people in God's presence forever on a new heaven and a new earth. That is future heaven. That's the heaven that will last forever. And so when you read the Bible and it talks about heaven in physical terms, that's why. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. In fact, Paul in Philippians 3.21 says this, Christ will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Just as Jesus was resurrected, we will receive a resurrected body in a new heaven and a new earth. That is future heaven. That's what waits for followers of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but the earth will be resurrected as well, a new earth, a new heaven, and a new earth. And if we grab a hold of that, all of a sudden the Bible makes a whole lot more sense when it talks about heaven. And all of a sudden, I don't know about you, but I get a lot more excited about spending eternity on a new heaven and a new earth when I've got a physical body to do all the things I enjoy today without sin. Without sin, that's our future. But what is present hell and present heaven like? What is eternal life like right now? I want you to turn your Bibles right now to Luke 16. So if you've got a Bible, open it up and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke is the third gospel. It's Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. And in chapter 16, Jesus describes heaven and hell. He tells a parable. And it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And if you've grown up in church or been around the church for a while, this parable is probably pretty familiar to you. And, and in it, we get a glimpse of what heaven and hell are really like. And here's what Jesus says in this story in Luke 16, 19, he says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. He had the life on earth, the life that all people want. But look at verse 20. But at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus who was covered in sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked Lazarus' sores. So you get this juxtaposition, this rich man who had everything on earth, this poor man, Lazarus, who physically was unwell, who had no money, who couldn't even move his body so the dogs would come and lick his sores. You get this image of about the worst possible life on planet earth. But yet look at verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. You see, Lazarus, as bad as his life was, because he had faith in God, when he died, his soul, his spirit went to heaven to be by Abraham's side. But the rich man also died and was buried. Look at verse 23. In Hades, in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now this is terrifying. Do you get the picture of hell? There's suffering. There's torment for this rich man. And not only that, he's alone. There's no mention of anybody with him. And not only that, this rich man is aware of the wonder and the glory of present heaven. He can see it 
He just can't experience it. So he called out, verse 24, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. He cries out to heaven. But verse 25, Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. He says, because of your lack of faith, your life on earth was the best it would ever get. And because of the faith of Lazarus, his life on earth, as awful as that is, is the worst it will ever get for him. He's being comforted now because he believed in me. He believed in God. And look at verse 26. And besides all this, between us, you and I, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from where you are to here. What he said is this, once you die, once your soul goes to heaven or hell, you are stuck. There's no second chance. There's no do-overs. There's no maybe I'll get there someday. It's you are there and that's where you will stay. And if you're like me, you read this and you shudder a little bit at the reality of hell, this conscious torment where I can see heaven, but I can never be there, where I'm separated from the presence of God. But at the same time, if you're like me, this passage gives you hope. Because like Lazarus, no matter how bad your life is now, it's all the hell you ever have to experience in Christ. It's as bad as it'll ever be because eternal life waits. And my friends, when you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you get a pretty clear picture of what present heaven is like. And so I'm going to summarize by giving you these five things that present heaven is like, where your loved ones are now in Christ. Where if you die tonight, this is where you would go. This is what you would experience. So I want you to write these down. What is present heaven like? Well, first, it's the presence of God. In heaven, currently, present heaven, you get to experience the presence of God, the very presence of God. You get to be in his presence, perfect presence. Not only that, but the second thing is this. Present heaven is full of worship. Angels are worshiping God in heaven. Your loved ones in Christ are worshiping God in heaven. Creatures around the throne of God worship God right now in heaven. And not only that, but but number three, you're going to be reunited with your loved ones who died in Christ. Present heaven is a place of reunion, of connection, of seeing the people that you love who are in Christ. And then number four, when Jesus was on the cross, remember when he's on the cross? And the thief says, I want to be with you. Jesus says, surely you'll be with me today in paradise. He calls it paradise. That's how good present heaven is. And present heaven is like this. No physical pain or suffering. There's no more suffering. There's no more pain. There's just perfection. That's a picture of what heaven is like right now. Now, here are some things that present heaven is not like. And I have to say these things because for a lot of us, we grew up hearing these things or believing these things. We don't become angels when we go to heaven. Though our soul is separated from our physical body, we do not become angels in heaven. Angels were created to be angels. People were created to be people. And although we'll get to be around angels and interact with angels, we don't become angels when we die. The other thing you need to know is this. It's not our final destination or state. Present heaven is not. Our final destination is new heaven, new earth. Our final state is resurrected bodies on a new heaven and new earth with Jesus. Also, you need to know this. There's no purgatory or third place. There's no such thing as soul sleep. When the Bible talks about us falling asleep, it's referring to our physical body waiting for resurrection, sleeping in the grave until resurrection. And then lastly, here's what the Bible doesn't teach. It doesn't teach that we're not in heaven because God needs us. You need to know this. We're not in heaven because God needs us. Heaven is created. We are created. God is not. God is all sufficient. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need heaven, but because God is love. God wanted to create us and he wanted to create heaven. He wanted us to be with him. And I'd much rather have God want me near him than to say that God needs me near him. God wants us to be with him in heaven. Now go back to the slide before this. Go back to the one that talks about what heaven is like real quick. Go back a few. I want you to see what what heaven is like one more time. So here's what present heaven is like. Now here's the thing. You think about how good this is and how amazing this is. Here's what you need to know. It gets even better than that. Because when Jesus returns, here's what happens. He resurrects all of us. Heaven, hell, present earth. We're all resurrected. We all receive a resurrected body. Some to eternal condemnation, some to eternal life. New heaven, new earth. And I want you to see what the Bible says about this resurrection and about this final judgment. 
I want you to turn your Bibles to Revelation 20. So you're in Luke 16 now. So turn all the way to the end of the Bible. And we're going to spend the rest of our time together this weekend in the last three chapters of Revelation because I want you to see this picture of future heaven. This picture of a new heaven and a new earth. And I want you to grab a vision for what it's going to be like. Here's what the Bible says will happen when Jesus returns. We receive a resurrected body. Every molecule of our DNA that's scattered wherever it is on the earth will come together in a resurrected body. And look at what Revelation 20 verse 11 says. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on the throne. The heavens and the earth fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw all the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And by the way, this is the same judgment that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, the separating of the sheep and the goats. And we as Christians, we don't have to be afraid of this judgment because Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ because our name is written in the book of life and we will be judged according to what Jesus has done for us. Look what it says in verse 13. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown in the lake of fire. Here's what happens in the end when we are resurrected. Everything bad and evil gets thrown in the lake of fire. Satan, sin, death, sinners separated from God are all thrown in the lake of fire. And here's what that means. There's no more death. There's no more temptation. There's no more judgment for sin. It's all dealt with in that moment. And here's what happens to you and I after that point. We are resurrected to a new heaven and a new earth, perfect bodies with God forever. And so we're going to spend the rest of our time this weekend answering three questions that are really important, that have massive implications for what we believe. And so here are the three questions we're going to look at. What will the new heaven and new earth be like? What will our resurrected bodies be like? And what will we do for eternity on the new heaven and new earth? Are we going to be bored? That's the question we're going to answer, okay? And here's what I want you to see in Revelation 21. I want you to see this beautiful picture of a new heaven and a new earth that just blows your mind. Look at Revelation 21.1. Look what it says. John says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Isn't that a beautiful image? Heaven coming to earth. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will be with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. Heaven literally coming to earth. Heaven and earth united as one. God's dwelling place. God making earth his home. (laughs) Look at verse 4. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And notice God said, I'm making everything new. Not I'm scrapping earth, not I'm scrapping heaven and starting over. I'm recreating what was old. I'm remaking. I'm reconciling. I'm renewing my creation. Heaven and earth united like it was in Eden before the fall, only better. Skip down to verse 15. Look what it says. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, the new Jerusalem and its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. Do you know how big 12,000 stadia is? It is 1,400 miles. (laughs) The new Jerusalem, the holy city of God, where we will dwell is 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles wide, and 1,400 miles high, which I did the math, is 600,000 stories. That is a big city. <laughs> Don't worry about oxygen. God's got that figured out, right? That's a big city, a glorious city. And look at what verse 22 says. I did not see a temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. God is the temple. 
The city does not need sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it, and on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. No sin, no crime, no security systems, just perfection. 26, the glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into this city. Nothing impure will ever enter the city, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, those of us who are in Christ, stepped over the faith line, trusted in Jesus. This is our eternal home, a new heaven and a new earth. And look at chapter 22, and look at these first three verses. This is astounding. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life. You remember the tree of life? The tree that was in the Garden of Eden? The tree that is now in present heaven will be planted in the new heaven and the new earth to give us all life and sustenance. Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for what? The healing of the nations, for our healing. Verse 3, no longer will there be any curse. The curse is reversed. Here's what that means. No more sin. No more, no more pain. No more futility. No more separation between God and man and between each other and between us and creation. The curse is reversed. And I don't know about you, but when I read Revelation 21 and 22, I start to get really, really excited because it paints this beautiful picture of the new heaven and the new earth where we will be in Christ with resurrected bodies. And not only that, We read Revelation 21 and 22, but we also get clues about the new heaven and new earth based on what Eden was like before the fall. What was Eden like before the fall? Well, it was a place without sin. It's a place of harmony, a place of peace between us and creation, a place without disease or sin or guilt or shame, a place of incredible beauty. And not only that, but we get a glimpse of what our resurrected bodies will be like when we see the resurrected Jesus in the Gospels. Remember what Jesus was like when he resurrected? He looked like himself, only a little bit different. He was about the same age. He had healed nail scars in his hands and his feet. He talked. He hugged people. He ate. He hung out with people he knew. He had a memory. He remembered people and places, and they remembered him. When we put these three things together, we can start to answer those three questions, right? Revelation 21 and 22, what Eden was like before the fall, and what the resurrected Jesus was like. And when we put those three together, here's what we begin to see about these three questions about the new heaven and the new earth. What will eternity be like? And we're going to answer these questions one at a time. The first question is this, what will the new heaven and earth be like? It's going to be awesome, okay? It's going to be awesome. Here's why. Number one, it is a perfect creation. It's a perfect creation. It's like Eden, only better because all that is lost and broken will be redeemed. No sin, no brokenness, just healing and perfection with billions of people together. Now, some of you are like, I don't like people and I don't like crowds. Listen, they're not sinful anymore. You'll love them, okay? And you think mountains are beautiful now. You think streams and canyons are beautiful now. Wait till the new heaven and the new earth. Wait till you see them then. You think food tastes good now? I bet even kale tastes good on the new heaven and the new earth, all right? It's perfect. Not only that, but here's what you need to know about the new heaven and new earth. It is full of reunions and reconciled relationships. All the brokenness, all the fighting, all the frustration we experience in marriage and friendships and, and parent-child relationships will be done. It'll be over with. You know that feeling when you lose something really valuable and then you find it and you're just like, Whew, right? Or if, you, if you've had a relationship before that went sour, went south, and then you, you were reconciled and you forgave one another and you remember that feeling of it feels even sweeter because you lost it, but now you've got it. It was lost and found. It was reconciled and restored. That's what heaven is like on an infinite scale. Friends and family who've died in Christ that we get to hug and embrace physically again, that we get to spend all of eternity spending time with them, loving them, encouraging them, knowing them. And my friends, if you've lost a child, this is hope. And here's why. You're gonna see your child in a new heaven and a new earth. You're going to embrace your child in the new heaven and the new earth. If you've lost a child to disease, to an accident, to miscarriage, to abortion, to stillbirth, you're going to see that child again in a new heaven and a new earth. I'm going to talk about a hug. (laughs) 
That's a hug, my friends. A new heaven and a new earth, redeemed relationships where they're made right. Not only that, but here's what you need to know about a new heaven and new earth. It's going to be a redeemed universe. Not just heaven and earth, but the entirety of God's universe will be redeemed. Here's what I think that means. We will get to explore planets, moons, stars. Our universe is ever expanding. There are a billion trillion stars in the known universe. That sounds like a number made up. I promise it's real, okay? A billion trillion stars. Can you imagine on a new heaven and new earth spending eternity exploring all of God's creation, not just earth, but the universe? And not only that, some of you have been waiting for this. Here we go. Yes, there will be animals. And some of you animal lovers have been like, I've been waiting the whole time. Do we get to spend eternity with animals? Yes, you do. And here's why I believe that. There were animals in Eden before the fall. And they were good. There are animals and creatures in the present heaven that are worshiping God right now. And God saved all the animals on the ark with Noah. That was a symbol of judgment. And yet God saved all the animals. And so yes, there will be animals on a new heaven and a new earth. And yes, I think that opens the door to you and I having an eternal life with our pets forever. I have a cat and a dog, and I pray that that is true. I absolutely pray that's true. So that's what new heaven and new earth will be like. Now, what will we be like? In a new heaven and new earth, what will our resurrected bodies be like? Here's what they'll be like, like ourselves now, only without sin or disease or imperfection. We won't have illness or disease or fatigue or all the things that annoy us about being human right now. Anything that's the effect of the fall and sin will be removed and reversed. Well, how old will we be? I think we're going to be a perfect age. So I think it's somewhere between 18 and 35. So if you fall outside that range, here's what's going to happen. If you die, you will reverse or advance. I truly believe that to be true because that's about where Jesus was at. I also believe it's possible that children who die young can grow to that perfect age in heaven, which is a really cool thought, that as parents, we might get to see our kids even grow to that perfect age in heaven before DNA would normally break down. Not only that, but we can use 100% of our brain in a resurrected body. We use 10% now, right? And it's pathetic. <laughs> Imagine using all of your brain to create music and art and all kinds of wonderful things and relate and know and understand with 100% of your brain in a resurrected body. That is amazing. And not only that, but here's what you need to know about our resurrected bodies. We're going to retain memories and personality and godly desires. We're going to be us. We'll be recognizable to people. Personality, apart from sin, will stay mostly the same. We're going to be who we are. You will have a name. And you'll get to do all the things that you love to do on this new heaven and new earth. And not only that, but the longings and the desires of our heart will come true. will be fulfilled. So my wife, Amy, loves the sun. She's like a child of the sun. When it's cloudy, she gets miserable. And if it's cloudy for like three days, like stick a fork in her eye. Like she's, she hates it, right? She's like, Arr! And I used to make fun of her. Until this week, and here's why. I had this thought. <laughs> what if her longing for the sun is actually a longing for a new heaven and a new earth where the sun always shines? And then I had this thought. <laughs> How many of our longings where we feel they're just misplaced on earth are going to be met in a new heaven and a new earth? How many of the things that we long to experience are going to be realities then? So I stopped making fun of my wife this week. <laughs> And I started thinking about a new heaven and a new earth differently because I needed to. And speaking of my wife, resurrected bodies, what about marriage? Here's what Jesus said in Luke and in Mark. He said, in heaven, in resurrection, we will not be married or get married. Why? Because in the new heaven and the new earth, there's only one marriage that counts, and that's the marriage between Jesus, the groom, and his bride, the church. There won't be married people in heaven. But here's what there will be people that have been married. <laughs> so here's what that means. If you love your spouse and you're best friends with your spouse, guess who your best friend, if they're in Christ, will be in, in a new heaven and new earth? Your spouse. You will spend time with them. You'll be best friends with them. You'll grow with them. You'll experience the new heaven and the new earth with them. Even though you're not married, you will know them and love them and be with them forever. So breathe easy. Breathe easy. But that's what our resurrected bodies are going to be like now. Here's the big question. What are we going to do? What are we going to do for all of eternity in a new heaven and a new earth? Because forever is a long, long time. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship continually. And some of you hate to sing. And you're like, please tell me that it's not singing all the time. It's not, okay? Because here's the deal. You're going to worship God continually because everything you do will be worshipful. Everything you say, every desire of your heart, 
Everything you do or don't do will be worship in God's eyes because there will be no opportunity to sin. Worship all the time. Here's what else new heaven and new earth is like. Experiencing ever-increasing joy and pleasure. We get little moments of pleasure on earth, right? Cheesecake. Amazing, right? A whole lot of things. We get little glimpses of pleasure, but the new heaven and the new earth will be like that all the time. One pleasure after another. And not only that, on the new heaven and the new earth, here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn. We're going to explore. We're going to work. And we're going to create. And some of you are like, I hate work. Here's why you hate work. You don't like what you do and you work with sinful people. <laughs> Those two things in new heaven and new earth will disappear. They will not be realities. You will enjoy work. There will be music and art in heaven. And farmers, imagine what it would be like. Perfect crop, no insecticide, no herbicide, right? Perfect crops all the time in heaven. And then lastly, here's what we're going to do in a new heaven and new earth. We're going to love perfectly. All the ways we want to love people, all the times that sin gets in the way of loving God and loving others, that'll disappear. We're going to love people perfectly. And I don't know about you, but when I think about all of these things, for all of eternity with God's people and with God himself, I get really excited. And I start to long for heaven in a way that makes me excited for the afterlife. It makes me excited to live this life differently knowing knowing what waits for me on the other side and I don't have to be afraid. My friends at Prairie Lakes Church, this is why we celebrate baptism. And in just a moment at all of our campuses, we're gonna celebrate baptism. And one of the reasons why baptism is so powerful is when someone's in the tub and they come up out of the water, it's a symbol of resurrected life, not just today. When they're baptized, we say, you're gonna be resurrected to a new heaven and a new earth and a resurrected body with Jesus forever. That's why baptism means so much to us at Prairie Lakes Church. And my friends, here's the wonderful thing about eternal life. You don't have to guess about where you're going to spend eternal life. You don't have to, to wonder. You don't have to live in fear or anxiety of, is the new heaven and new earth my destination? In fact, here's what John says. The same John that wrote Revelation. Here's what he said in 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life today. You can know that you're bound for heaven. You don't have to wonder. So my friends, do you know? Do you know that this new heaven and new earth is for you? Do you know that present heaven is where you would go if you died today? If you don't, before you leave your campus this weekend, before you log off of your screen, I want you to reach out and ask. Ask for some prayer. Ask for some clarity and say, hey, I want to know. I want to be confident because I want a resurrected body in perfection. New heaven and new earth someday. That's what I want. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate that reality through baptism. Before we do that, let's pray right now. Let's ask for God's help. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you don't just save us in this life, but you give us everlasting life. Father, a present heaven that is incredible, that is paradise without sin, and then an even better new heaven and new earth and a resurrected body where we will experience all the longings of our heart fulfilled. God, that's where we want to be with you forever. Father, we have this hope. We have this hope. So Father, would you help us live today in light of the future we're going to experience with you forever. And Father, would you help us to tell the people around us, God, about this reality that they need to know, that they can know that they're bound for heaven through Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.